Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show in a dramatic week where a poisoning in the English city of Salisbury has developed into a full-blown international crisis. The identification of the Soviet-developed nerve agent Novichok as being the substance which poisoned the double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia turned the issue from an attempted murder to what the UK government have termed an act of state aggression. This is what the major players have had to say over the course of this week. With permission, Mr Speaker, it is now clear that Mr Skripal and his daughter were poisoned with a military-grade nerve agent of a type developed by Russia. This is part of a group of nerve agents known as Novichok. Based on the positive identification of this chemical agent by world-leading experts at the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory at Porton Down, our knowledge that Russia has previously produced this agent and would still be capable of doing so. As soon as we get the facts straight, and we're going to be speaking with the British today, we're speaking with Theresa May today, and as soon as we get the facts straight, if we agree with them, we will condemn Russia or whoever it may be. But I have not spoken to her. I'll speak to her sometime today. Later, we'll be asking commentators, both domestic and international, where exactly this escalating confrontation is likely to lead. But first, over to Alex for a discussion with someone who's been on the receiving end of many human rights abuses. Peter Tatchell shot to prominence in the Bermondsey by-election of 1983, one of the most controversial and bruising confrontations of the political century. But this is not where his story ended. He has pursued for half a century a worldwide campaign for LGBT and other human rights, and that's been greatly to his personal cost. Peter Tatchell joins me now. Peter, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Good to join you. Give me an idea of the, the sort of attacks you've had over that long period you've been campaigning for, for human rights. Well, over the last 50 years, I've been violently assaulted over 300 times. 300? 300 times. I've had more than 50 violent attacks upon my flat, including three arson attempts and a bullet through the front door. Um, it's been very, very, very tough. And the people targeting me are homophobes, far-right extremists, um, supporters of various tyrannical regimes around the world who I've challenged. Um, but I'm not defeated by it. And in a way, I take the attacks as a backhanded compliment. Obviously, I'm doing something right. I'm riling those who are, are abusing human rights, and this is their reaction. So, you know, I take it with a, a pinch of salt. Now, you've taken your campaign to, to, to many countries, uh, but you've also taken it to, to Russia uh, many times. Uh, tell me your experience uh, when you took your, your campaign for LGBT rights to Russia. Well, you have, I've been several times, but in 2007 I went there at the invitation of Russian LGBT and human rights activists to support the right to hold a gay pride parade in Moscow. Now, under Russia's law and constitution, um, the right to peaceful protest is guaranteed. Yeah. So these people weren't asking for anything special or illegal, but the protest was banned and I went with the Russian delegation to try and deliver a letter to the Moscow city mayor. And we were then violently attacked by the riot police uh, and by neo-Nazis, who I believe were acting in coordination with the police. Um, I was almost beaten unconscious. Um, the police stood all around watching me while I was being beaten by ultra-nationalists and neo-Nazis. And then I was, when I was about to lose consciousness, they stepped in and arrested me while my assailants were allowed to walk free. And when I was in the police van, I saw at least one of those assailants, the guy who punched me in the eye and caused me permanent damage, I saw him approach the police line, show some kind of ID and be waved through. So the suspicion is that he was actually a plainclothes police officer or someone working in collusion with the police to attack me and the other gay pride uh, marches. Now you've been back on a, a number of occasions still campaigning. What would your, your message be to, well, to Vladimir Putin uh, and to the rest of the Russian leadership in terms of their attitude to, to gay rights? Well I love the Russian people and love Russia as a country. I want to see good relations with Russia 
but essentially today Russia is a police state. You know, protests are routinely banned and violently attacked by the police. Uh, the media is largely under state control and subjected to extreme censorship. Um, we've got many examples of opposition politicians and critical journalists who've been assassinated. This is a lawless police state. And the uh, uh, latest development with the allegations about uh, the spy in Britain uh, being killed, uh, that's really a, a, an addition to a whole litany of terrible things that the Russian state is doing. And I do think that with any human rights abusing regime, whether it be Russia or any other country, the international community needs to take a stand. And I would like to see the universal application of the Minitsky Act um, to uh, penalise... The, the Act on Financial Transactions, which allow the targeting of specific individuals. That's right. Uh, under the Magnitsky Act, human rights abusers, not just Russian, but anywhere, would be subject to the seizure of assets, uh, travel bans, and other kinds of financial penalties. Um, I think we need to take a stand against all human rights abuses. And I'm not saying that Britain and the United States have a blemish-free record, but what Russia has done to its own people and what it's done in Chechnya, Georgia, Ukraine and Syria are clearly violations of international human rights law. And we need to take a stand. Now, in terms of upcoming events, that the Commonwealth, the, uh, well, with the summit, uh, which is uh, ju just coming up, and the Commonwealth Day we've just had this week, and the Commonwealth Games, of course, uh, starting next month in the Gold Coast in Australia. But wh how do you see your campaign as with the, the Commonwealth group of countries? Well, there are 53 member states in the Commonwealth, and 37 of them have a total prohibition on homosexuality. Um, nine of them have life imprisonment in parts of two countries, two Commonwealth countries, LGBT people can be put to death. Uh, that is completely in violation of the principles of the Commonwealth Charter, which guarantee universal human rights, and which all those member states have signed up to. So again, the Commonwealth needs to wake up. It needs to stand true to its principles, and we need to ensure that the 100 to 200 million lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people who live in Commonwealth countries where it's criminalized, that that criminalization is ended, and they have protection against discrimination and hate crime. Lastly, is it possible to, to use events, for example, like the, the Commonwealth Games, to, to send out a positive message? And are the organisers really duty-bound uh, to make sure that happens? Well, absolutely. The, the Commonwealth is founded on principles of human rights. Uh, there is a commitment that every Commonwealth citizen, no matter which country or who they are, has full and equal human rights. But it's not just LGBT rights that are being violated in the Commonwealth. Many other human rights are also being violated. And we just need to say, I think, to Commonwealth countries, if you want to be part of the Commonwealth, you have to live up to its principles. And you know, what is shocking is that Commonwealth leaders completely ignore human rights abuses. They're having a summit in Britain in April. And I bet that human rights won't be on the agenda. And one of the reasons is, of course, so many Commonwealth countries violate human rights. And that has got to change. Peter, it's been a, a long campaign that you've pursued, as I said, to, to great personal cost. Over the piece, over the, the half century, are, are you relatively pleased with the progress that's been made? Or alternatively, you think, well, there's so much still to be done? Well, undoubtedly, there's been huge progress. And that's a tribute not just to uh, people like me, activists, but also the many members of the public in this country and around the world who have rallied to the support the principle of human rights for everyone. And so I'm, I'm optimistic and, and but also mindful of the work that still needs to be done. So I've been doing this for 51 years. I'm hopefully going to carry on for another 20 or 30. Um, to me, human rights are a fundamental principle of our humanity and everybody in every country deserves them. Now, now, Peter, you're best known, obviously, for your work on LGBT rights domestically, internationally. But that really doesn't do justice to the full range of your, your human rights activity. Tell us a bit about that. I'm striving to support democracy and human rights campaigners in many different countries, including Russia, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Iran and Pakistan. These people are really heroic defenders of human rights. Many of them are suffering incredible abuses by governments. 
and I think it's really important to stand with them. Although I'm a critic of religious homophobia, I also campaign to defend religious minorities, uh, Christians persecuted in Pakistan, um, Sunni Muslims persecuted in Iran. To me, human rights are universal. Bert Patchell, uh, just one more thing. Uh, for appearing on the Alex Salmon show, you're entitled to the quick, a uh, Gaelic for a loving cup. You know, you know the drill, the whiskey in the quick, you pass it round only your close, close friends, and of course, only Scotch whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. I will treasure it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cheers. Dominating the headlines all week has been the reaction to the chemical weapons poisoning in Salisbury. These are the exchanges from the House of Commons yesterday. Either this was a direct act by the Russian state against our country, or conceivably the Russian government could have lost control of a military-grade nerve agent and allowed it to get into the hands of others. Mr Speaker, it was right to offer Russia the opportunity to provide an explanation. But their response has demonstrated complete disdain for the gravity of these events. They have provided no credible explanation that, they, that could suggest they lost control of their nerve agent. No explanation as to how this agent came to be used in the United Kingdom. No explanation as to why Russia has an undeclared chemical weapons programme in contravention of international law. Instead, they have treated the use of a military-grade nerve agent in Europe with sarcasm, contempt and defiance. So, Mr Speaker, there is no alternative conclusion other than that the Russian state was culpable for the attempted murder of Mr Skripal and his daughter and for threatening the lives of other British citizens in Salisbury, including Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey. Has the Prime Minister taken the necessary steps under the Chemical Weapons Convention to make a formal request for evidence from the Russian government under Article 9.2? How has she responded to the Russian government's request for a sample of the agent used in the Salisbury attack to run its own tests? Has high-resolution trace analysis been run on a sample of the nerve agent, and has that revealed any evidence as to the location of its production or the identity of its perpetrators? It was clear, it's clear from the conversations I've had with allies that we have a consensus with our allies. It was clear from the remarks that were made by backbenchers across the whole of this House on Monday that there is a consensus across the backbenches of this House. Yeah. I am only sorry that the consensus does not go as far as the Right Honourable Gentleman. have taken the opportunity, as the UK government has done, to condemn the culpability of the Russian state. The Prime Minister carried the overwhelming body of the House of Commons with her. However, neither the government or the Foreign Office were available to be interviewed on this programme, wishing instead to stand on the words from the House of Commons itself. When we return, however, we'll ask domestic and international commentators about their reading of the current crisis. Welcome back. Theresa May's statement on the measures to be taken against Russia on the chemical poisoning of the Skripals received overwhelming and cross-party support in the Commons. Can I welcome the Prime Minister's yeah. statement. Her conclusion about the culpability of the Russian state is an immensely serious one. And that, in addition to their breaches of international law, of the use of chemical weapons, but also their continued disregard for the rule of law and for human rights, must be met with unequivocal condemnation. Yeah. As the Prime Minister has stated, the attack on Mr Skripal and his daughter was an unlawful use of force by the Russian state against the United Kingdom. Can I say that I and my party fully support the Prime Minister's statement? Yeah. It's clear that almost unanimously across the House there is support for my right honourable friend's proportionate and right response to this crisis. Near unanimous support for the Prime Minister's position in the House of Commons, 
However, some commentators do not have the same degree of certainty. To look further into this uh, murky world of espionage, uh, I'm joined from Brussels by Annie Machon, uh, a former MI5 officer. Annie Machon, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you. Annie Machon, when it was determined that it was the Soviet-developed nerve agent Novichok that was responsible for the poisoning of Mr Skripa and his daughter, wasn't the Prime Minister entitled to think it was a slam dunk that it was Russia who did it? I think it's clear from her very carefully worded statement in, in Parliament that she did not immediately say it was Russia as a state power. She said either it was Russia as a state power or that they had um, not protected their nerve agent sources adequately and it might have fallen into the wrong hands. And I think that's certainly an avenue that we need to look at. But Russia, of course, have the means and some would argue have the track record of this sort of thing. Isn't it therefore a, a reasonable conclusion that they would be suspect number one? Of course, they're going to be suspect number one. Um, it doesn't mean that they are suspect number one or they should be convicted by public opinion and the media, which is what has been going on for over a week now. There needs to be an ev evidential chain built up by the police um, and they do need to cooperate with their Russian colleagues to try and get to the bottom of this case. Does any organisation really have the capability of conducting such an operation? The most key point in this investigation, in my opinion, is to find out exactly what Skripal has been involved in over the last eight years since he was relocated to the UK. So we have a situation where a man um, betrayed his country for 10 years. He was working as an MI6 agent. He was caught, he was tried, he was convicted, and he was sent to prison in Russia for that treachery. And then he was pardoned by the Russian state and released in the spy swap of 2010 with the American sleeper. Uh, agents, including Anna Chapman. And then he was sent to the UK and was given a pension by MI6 and has been living notionally under their protection ever since. So in terms of an intelligent asset, this guy was rinsed clean by both sides before he got to the UK. So I can't see that it would necessarily be related to his spy work in the past. So I think the motive is probably going to be found in what he's been involved in since, uh, who he's been working with, um, or who his contacts are. So I would assume that the intelligence agencies have acquired a warrant from the Home Secretary. They've gone and collected his computers, his phones, and they're trawling through all his records to try and build up a picture of what his current life has been, because that is where I think the indication, the motive for this type of attack will be. Now, the police investigation, as you rightly say, is ongoing. What international bodies are there who can assist with this investigation and bring about an international consensus on who was responsible? Well, it's very much down to the police and the intelligence agencies of the UK to try and establish what happened to one of their spies who was living under their protection in the UK. Um, what happened to him? Um, yes, they can call upon uh, expert bodies around the world. Yes, they can try and bring in experts in chemical warfare particularly. But, of course, they have portened down the British Chemical Warfare Centre only about six miles down the road from Salisbury. Um, and we've seen as well from reports, until the forensic case has been made, until we can find the motive for why this attack happened. I think it's very dangerous in these diplomatically fragile times to point the finger at uh, another state actor. I mean, bear in mind, this uh, agent, Novichok, was developed in the 80s by Soviet Russia and appears to have been used in an attack in the UK in 2018. Now, you could, to say it's Russia, therefore, seems a little disingenuous. For example, the brother of Kim Jong-un, the head of the North Korean state, was assassinated last year in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia, with the use of a nerve gas called VX. Now, this was developed by the Brits in Porton Down in the 1950s. Does that automatically mean it's the Brits that assassinated this guy? I don't think so. Annie Machon, thank you so much for joining us from Brussels today. I'm now joined by Mary Dejewski, the writer and broadcaster, who has substantial experience in these matters, including three years as a foreign correspondent in Moscow. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, Mary. Looking at the exchanges in the Commons, the Prime Minister seems pretty sure of her ground and has taken the vast majority of the, the Commons with her. The stronger her words, the stronger the action, the greater the support is going to be. And I think one of the reasons for this is because people remember the Alexander Litvinenko killing. 
And one of the ways they remember it, which I think is not actually accurate, but one of the ways they remember it is that the British were soft on the Russians. And this is used as an explanation to say why the Russians tried it again. But surely the Russians are, are at the very least the number one suspects. I mean, they are top of the, top of the list, are they not? The, there is a distinction between something which is ordered from the very top, from the Kremlin, with full authorization, and something that happens either by sort of rogue operators or by, say, a cabal or small group inside part of the security services. Yes, you know, that doesn't say much about the authority of Vladimir Putin, that maybe people can do this um, freelancing. But is that possible, given everything we... We are told about Vladimir Putin. He's not yes, the, well, the sort of guy who allows people to freelance, is it? Well, I think this is one of the things that has been got so wrong in much of Western reporting about Russia, which is the idea that Putin can sit in the Kremlin and snap his fingers and lo and behold, something happens all over Russia. Um, one of the things that I think has been so frustrating to Putin right through the time that he's been in power in Russia is the fact that there are institutions and there are individuals and there are parts of the country which are simply out of central control, which it's very difficult to make all of Russia do what you want it to do. And that could include bits of the intelligence services. Now, Jeremy Corbyn asked for more evidence. He got pretty short shrift from the Prime Minister and indeed from his own back benches. Um, both Jeremy Corbyn's call for more evidence and the Russians' call for more evidence um, in a way has, I think, um, forced to raise a May's hand um, that this is actually going to international institutions. But of course that is not such a nice simple argument to present in the Commons as saying our evidence is that Russia did it and we're expelling 23 diplomats. Presumably to recruit solid support from friends and allies. Uh, where do you think we stand with that at the present moment? It's not so easy for Britain to gather that support that it was always so used to. And I think this may be the shape of things to come. Clearly the government drew back from any suggestion of withdrawing the English football team as opposed to royalty and to government ministers from going to, going to Russia. Do we have a a finger on the pulse at all. What do you think the public are making of all this? My feeling is that there's much more questioning among the public at large as saying, well, you know, maybe there's a hole in this argument, maybe it's not quite as cut and dried as people think it is, um, or as it's being presented to us. And I think uh, one of the origins for this is the enormous amount of mistrust that you have among the public for the political establishment. You know, we've seen it over the last 10 years or so um, that people simply do not trust the people who are governing them. What's the likely response that's going to come from Vladimir Putin to the measures uh, announced by Theresa May yesterday? Well, um, we saw in the last set of well-publicised expulsions when President Obama expelled um, Russian diplomats just before he left office, um, Putin turned round and refused to retaliate, which Donald Trump, of course, said was a smart move um, and, as it were, set the tone for what Putin and probably Trump both hoped was going to be improved relations. Now, there is no such calculation to be made here. Relations between Britain and Russia are, um, I mean, it's, it's hardly possible to say they're worse than they have been before because relations have been so bad for most of the last 20 years. So I don't think there's anything in it for Putin to be seen as being soft on the UK. So I rather suspect we're in for one-for-one one retaliation. Mary Dejewski, one thing is certain, and that's uh, for appearing on the Alex <laughs> Salmon show, you're entitled to uh, a quake. Oh, uh, wow. Which, uh, which is Gaelic for a loving cup, the whiskey and the quake, <laughs> and then you, you administer the whiskey among your friends and, uh, and okay, well, uh, only your close friends okay. and only Scotch whiskey. Okay. Thank you Very so good. much, Mary. Okay. Thank you. I host this independently produced television show which is broadcast on RT International. Within the broadcasting laws which normally pertain in this country, I can say what I like about any issue, and so can any one of my interview guests, who have included current heads of state and government, as well as past prime ministers and presidents, MPs from different parties, baronesses, lords and knights of the realm. Not a single one of them has complained about being silenced, because not a single one of them has been. I hold no brief for the Kremlin, 
nor am I required to have. No one has tried to influence the content of this show in any way, shape or form whatsoever. By definition, RT has not been a propaganda station because it's regulated under a UK licence by Ofcom. Yes, it's had breaches of the Ofcom code, but so have Sky, ITV and the BBC. For some, however, independent regulation is not enough. Newspapers who objected to even the mildest of statutory regulation of their own industry now think that independent regulation is somehow inadequate for broadcasting and should be replaced by effective state censorship. The chemical poisoning in Salisbury was a heinous crime and should be universally condemned. The best way to deal with crime is to take the suspects when identified through the courts domestic and international. The UK government is totally convinced that the Russian state is involved and are therefore entitled to take a range of additional measures, diplomatic and economic. Of course, it's much more effective to operate in concert with friends and allies. To succeed, the evidence has to be overwhelming and the case cast iron, as the leader of the opposition correctly pointed out to the Prime Minister. He didn't get much support for making that point in the House of Commons, but that does not make him wrong. Pursuing the case internationally is essential and you're unlikely to succeed at the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons or the United Nations without the production of such conclusive evidence. When the UK government produces their evidence, then the Russian government will have no alternative but to answer. Meanwhile, unilateral domestic measures, which could still have a real impact, are those which follow the money, whether it's the Magnitsky Act or something even more rigorous and far-reaching, which tackles the ill-gotten gains of the few instead of the general sanctions which hurt the many. But don't shut down TV stations because your standpoint is so uncertain that you must exclude other perspectives. Between Monday and yesterday, the, the Prime Minister sensibly drew back from that proposal. But nor should this be attempted by indirect pressure on an independent regulator. To censure would make a travesty of the concept of nation speaking unto nation, a mockery of freedom of speech, and it would portray an image of a country lost in self-doubt. It would also strike a fatal bargain. Liberal democracies don't succeed in international confrontations by sacrificing their dearest held values of freedom of speech. Until next week, I hope. Goodbye for now.